Okay, I'm going to make a start. Um, so thank you everybody for coming to join our business growth opportunities from the green economy. Um, Kingston Council, in partnership with the Kingston Chamber of Commerce, want to help businesses grow back from this pandemic stronger and greener. Um, there will be innovation and the opportunities to lead on glean, glean, clean technologies even, nationally and equally importantly, locally. However, I think we can all benefit from actually understanding some of the background to this, the terms and facts, and this is where we are today as a starting point. So I think this is actually going to be really important and very exciting. As I just showed to the group before we started, on the Times on Sunday, it, the time is now for climate action. Um, we have some excellent guest speakers who will help us to understand questions such as what are the business opportunities in the transition to a green economy? What does a green economy actually mean? And which barriers may prevent businesses from becoming greener and how can these be removed? Um, I want to thank, thank Kingston Council and Iona Rossi in particular, who's done sterling work pulling this all together, and the Green Task Force team, many of whom are here today helping in the session. So a big, big thank you to everybody involved. Um, the run through of the order for today is we're going to do an introduction section, um, which is going to be about 20 minutes. We then go into breakout sessions at around 10 to 11. Uh, ten, yeah, 10 to 11. Um, you will see these pop up. Now, as you may be aware, there are three breakout sessions. So it's up to you to choose which one you like to go to. There is built environment, construction, energy and transport. The second group is business, professional services, manufacturing and technology. And then the third group is hospitality, retail, arts and culture and leisure. We're gonna have a break just before 12 o'clock. And then after 12 o'clock, we're gonna do the plenary session where we just pull together all the views and summarize everything. Um, I suggest for everybody to use the speaker view in Zoom. For those who are familiar with it, you'll see it in the right hand corner. And this event is going to be recorded. So if you don't wish us to see your face, please switch off your camera. And as I've just said before, I'd be really grateful if you can put yourself on mute during the sessions. Um, questions can be put into the breakout, uh, in the chat feature rather. And in the breakout sessions, if you do have a question, raise your hand and we will try and get these answered as we go through. So, um, before we kind of, just as we get going with this now, um, I'm going to start with the introduction. And for this, we're joined by uh, four speakers. We've got Dr. Neil Jennings from the Graham Institute, D David Simons from WSP, um, Professor Audley Genus from Kingston University, and Isabella O'Dowd from WWF UK. So I'd like to welcome them, um, first of all, to Neil. And I'm just gonna start with the slides for this. And the purpose for this is to just give you an overall understanding of why, where we are and what we need to do and really just start defining some of the terminology for this debate. So I'm just gonna start the screen and hand this over to Neil. Morning everyone, uh, really pleased to be here. So I'll provide a bit of kind of scene setting of the, the science of climate change uh, in four minutes. Uh, so for the key thing to start off with is that we understand and can attribute global warming to human activities. So uh, we have, as you, I'm sure many of you are fully aware, we have these greenhouse gases that exist naturally in our atmosphere. Indeed, without these gases, the earth would be uninhabitable as, as far as as far as we are, as far as life uh, as we know it exists, the Earth would be a frozen mass of minus 18 degrees Celsius. But the key thing is that over the last 200 years, we've been radically destabilizing our atmosphere through particularly the combustion of fossil fuels, putting up uh, more of these gases into the atmosphere, um, particularly carbon dioxide and methane. So if we go to the next slide, Forbes. So um, over the last 200 years, we've increased the concentration of um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by over 50%. And the level in the atmosphere now is higher than it's been for at least the last two million years. So we're playing a rather dangerous experiment with our climate and that's having consequences in terms of meaning that more of the heat uh, coming from the earth is being trapped in the atmosphere, which is leading to 
um, increasing temperatures. If we go to the next slide, um, this gives an indication of the kind of changes that we've seen so far. So um, if you take at the bottom, the pre-industrial um, level, that's typically regarded as the baseline. We've had a one degree Celsius increase in temperatures already, just over one degree. Um, and in 2015, all the countries of the world, in recognition of this significant challenge, all the countries of the world came together in Paris and signed the Paris Agreement. And there are two key things were set in place. The aim to keep uh, global temperature rise this century below two degrees Celsius and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to um, 1.5 degrees. And I'll give an indication in a minute about why these thresholds are important. Um, but also the other key thing to mention is while this agreement is in place, all the countries of, of the world have set, in, set, um, set forth um, their ambi ambitions and their targets for reducing their emissions of greenhouse gases. And on the basis of those um, stated aims, their nationally determined contributions, we're on course for over a three degree rise in global temperature. So clearly a lot more needs to be done in order to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. And just going to the next slide, I'll just elaborate on, on what some of these things mean, because these numbers are often quite abstract. So if we look at that 1.5 degree threshold and that two degree threshold and what that means in terms of the impact that those different temperatures have upon the natural environment. So this is an example of warm water coral reefs. So if uh, global temperatures reach uh, 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, which at the current rate of change we're on course to do within the next 20 to 25 years, if that happens, then around 70 to 90% of the world's warm water corals um, will be bleached. They'll look like this through a combination of increasing temperatures and also um, the acidification of the oceans as well. If we reach that two degree threshold, then all warm water coral reefs are gone. Um, and this is something which at the current rate, will, which, which would happen within 50 years, unless there's significant action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So one of the most beautiful, pristine things we have in our natural world would be gone in 50 years unless we take really significant action to reduce emissions. So that's the natural side. And the next slide will go on to an example from um, the kind of impact upon society. So um, many of you will remember the really hot summer we had in 2018, which was record equaling at the time. So that was the hottest ever summer we'd had in the UK at the time. Um, if global temperatures increase um, to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, then that summer, which was really disruptive for our infrastructure, for our transport systems, you know, very difficult to sleep in many nights, that summer will occur uh, once in every four years. If we reach that two degree threshold, then that summer will be an average summer. It will occur on average once every other year. Um, and of course, as these things increase in the chance of these extreme events um, occurring, so the so the, the real extremes become even hotter and hotter and hotter. And then there's also various other extreme weather events that uh, will become more likely, including things like um, flooding as a result of warming temperatures. So onto the last slide, um, to briefly summarize what we need to do, uh, and, and it's clearly significant, to avoid the worst consequences of climate change, to avoid um, 1.5 degrees, we need to halve emissions globally by 2030, and get to net zero emissions by 2050. It's clearly a really significant um, transition that needs to take place, but there are also many benefits to doing so as well. And uh, my colleagues will pick up on those two points um, in a minute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, a very stark picture of what could be in front of us. Can I now welcome Audley um, from Kingston University? Um, he's gonna be more uh, audible with this. So um, I suggest that you go on to um, the speaker view for this as well, it might be helpful. Um, Audley, over to you. Thank you, Forbes. Um, okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm a professor of innovation at uh, Kingston Business School and uh, my speciality is uh, sustainable innovation. Um, now in my four minutes, I just wanna make three very quick points. Um, and they're based um, on reflections on what we call the transition to the green economy. Um, a number of the presenters uh, today actually belong to a, a council uh, committee, um, which is uh, called a transition to the green economy. Um, so the first point I want to make is that uh, when we refer to a transition, we're talking about a thing. It's a, it's a thing that is, uh, okay, it's everyday language, but it's also it's got a technical meaning academically and it's something that is studied and researched academically now without getting lost into all the uh, the, the minutiae and the technicality we just need to know that it's a it's been a growing um source of interest or subject of interest over the last 20 years 
we have journals devoted to looking at sustainability transitions in the economy. And that transition is usually looked at as something which occurs um, over a period of decades and represents the evolution of a technological system. So in the past, people looked at the, um, the evolution from horse-drawn carriages as a method of transport to automobiles, looking at say six or seven decades, which elapsed between the, you know, in, in the transition between those two states. We're concerned with something which is in the making. So rather than look historically at what has happened in the past uh, example of a transition, we are in the midst of something which is very urgent where we can't wait 60, 70, 80 years to analyze it. We need to be taking action now and we should have taken action yesteryear. Um, the second point I want to make is, is related to the, this urgency and it, it concerns how these transitions occur. So in the retrospective analyses in the past, there was a lot of attention to the landscape pressures which uh, induced policymakers to make um, uh, act legislation and regulations, which then induced um, uh, investors to innovate in, in new technologies or products. Um, in terms of what we're facing now, um, there is a certain amount of that, and as, what Neil, as Neil mentioned, we, uh, we look at agreements, uh, that, you know, the climate change agreements that we talk about. But I think a lot more attention in, in the literature is now on, first of all, what um, businesses do in terms of niches of innovation and how they can help to develop new technologies for um, re renewable en energy, generating energy from renewable sources and diffusing that. And secondly, partnerships. So the point that I want to make here is that we're not lame or devoid of agency. Sometimes we feel powerless and sometimes we feel that we're at the mercy of events and the changes that are occurring uh, around us. But I think a critical point in our literature now is to try to understand how new networks can be um, set up and new partnerships can uh, be created, which understand and take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves to us. So I think this is an example of that kind of thing, where we look at uh, partnerships between the Chamber of Commerce, the local authority, the university and businesses, which can jointly think about how to approach and deal with the challenges that we face. So I think a very important thing that we're doing here is uh, working on our partnership. And I, th I think the whole day is gonna be partly about that so that we understand the business opportunities that can arise as we work together. That is the, my timer telling me to stop. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And just to rest assured, as much as partnerships is vital, um, this is actually only two hours. This will not be going for the whole day, as Audley may have just <laughs> mentioned. So rest assured, but thank you very much, Audley. Um, I just, before I quickly go on to Isabella, um, I'm aware that somebody put in the chat, that they couldn't see the slide. So hopefully this time, it will work. Um, so please l uh, let us know if there's an issue. Um, but Isabella, welcome. And thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm Isabella O'Dowd, Head of Climate at WWF UK, and I've been leading our work on net zero um, for the last three years. Um, I was going to briefly just quickly touch on um, why net zero is so important and then move on to green recovery. Um, my work is mainly focused at the government level, um, which I'm going to go through today. Um, but I think it's really interesting to think about how this relates back to businesses and how we look at that in that context. So I think both Neil and Audley have really clearly set out why this issue is so important. Um, and Neil actually use my coral reef stats um, that I was going to mention, because for me, this shows how important it is um, to act on climate change and, and the urgency that we really need to um, look at. Could you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so back in 2018, we started to look at net zero and what was really needed to achieve that in the UK. Uh, next, please. Um, we produced a report with Vivid Economics that looked at two different pathways, one to get to net zero by 2050 and one that got to net zero by 2045. Um, the UK government in 2019 uh, set a target of net zero by 2050, 
And what we're really focusing on now is how do we achieve that target and how do we get a detailed action plan to meet up to that commitment? Next, please. So what does net zero actually mean in practice? So when we did our analysis, um, it showed that power, transport and heating all need to get to zero by 2050. Um, agriculture, aviation and shipping and industry can't get to zero and therefore we need to reduce them as much as possible and then we need to offset the remaining emissions um, through greenhouse gas removal technologies and at WWF we're really focused on the role that nature can play in removing those greenhouse gas emissions particularly when you look at tree planting restoration of peatland and grassland and how we how we use the land in the UK next please uh, so in terms of uh, once we got that target set in place for the government to achieve net zero, we started to really look at how do we how do we get on track and how do we make sure the government is adding up to their targets. So the main area that we were really focused on before COVID hit was the investments needed to get on track. And we just produced a piece of um, research that showed the investments needed and then what that could offer the UK in terms of annual benefits. We were due to publish this report just before COVID hit. Um, and we had to repurpose it in the lens of green recovery. And I think the report and the findings of the report are even more important when you look at it through this lens. Next, please. What it really showed, um, and actually we can go to the next slide, is that if you invest 40 billion into the, uh, the UK, that really unlocks 90 billion of annual benefits. And that's looking at improved health, um, from better air quality, it's looking at reduced risk from flooding and some of those impacts that Neil highlighted in his presentation at the start. And it also looks at the business growth opportunities. So what we can really unlock in terms of green jobs that are long lasting and fit for the future in the sectors that will be um, long lasting and, and we need in the future. Next slide, please. So the key findings, and there have been a lot more reports that have come out over the last year since this report, um, but it looked at green jobs with the highest being in the green building sector. Um, it also looked at these annual benefits of 90 billion through the improved health and living conditions. And it showed that for every pound spent on low carbon investment um, options, it returns three to eight times the initial investment. So I think this really clearly set out why a green recovery is so important and why we really need to build resilience from this crisis and pandemic so that we don't move from a health pandemic into a climate and environment um, crisis that we're already starting to see. Next slide, please. I think that was it. Oh, yes, actually. <laughs> no, uh, uh, you can, I'll carry on. Sorry, there were no more slides. You can stop sharing. So I think, the, when we look at the context of green recovery, I think it's also important to look at what's happened in previous financial shocks. Um, so when we look back at the last financial crisis, investing in low carbon solutions such as renewables and energy efficiency actually performed the best economically as shown and set out in an Oxford study that was published last year. So because of this context and green recovery being so important, at WWF we really focus on what we can encourage the UK government and particularly the Treasury to do. And we've been um, calling on the government to set a net zero test to make sure that reco recovery spending and budgets and the comprehensive spending review are really building resilience and making sure the money is going into the right sectors. Um, so we are currently in the process of developing that net zero test and trying to um, show to government why this is so important. I wanted to quickly finish um, by highlighting that our report also found that if you delay these investments by 10 years, it doubles for future generations. So I think we really need to act now and we need to see government putting those policies and investments in place. Um, in terms of the context of business, that's mainly kind of the work we do with government. And I'm conscious this is quite a business focused event today. So I just wanted to quickly reference a new guide that we published last month, which is called Emissions Possible, um, which is aimed at encouraging small businesses um, to help starting to look at um, their climate action and help them to report with some easy guides. 
So it's teaching SMEs the, that reporting process and helping them to understand what is being asked of them, um, helping facilitate how SMEs work with their own suppliers on emissions reporting with a sample data questionnaire. And it provides a list of the best reporting tools and resources. So if you have a look for Mission Possible, it came out um, last month um, and it might be useful in terms of some of the tools and tips in there uh, for your business today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabella. Some very, very interesting information there. And um, it's, it's great to hear from your perspective of these things. Um, can I now welcome David Simons, who's the UK Director of Sustainability at WSP. David, welcome. Thank you, Forbes. Um, hello, everybody. Great to, to, to be with you. No slides from me. So um, you've just got uh, you, you've just got the images and, and me talking for, for, for this couple of minutes. Um, and what I wanted to cover was was three things. I wanted to talk about business because that's who WSP is, what what uh, green means for, for us. Um, secondly, I want to talk about future and third, I want to talk about action. Um, so, so just picking up on, on business. So as the business representative on this introductory panel, um, for, for us, WSP, we have 50,000 people across the world. Um, we are a engineering and advisory business. We design um, things like the foundations and electrics for the Shard, 22 Bishopsgate. Um, we're working on electrifying rail lines um, and, uh, and, and a big advisory practice um, as well. Um, and the two main things for us on green is, is essentially that this is a growth opportunity. So in terms of particularly opportunities for, for growth, as a business, we employ 14,000 environmental professionals um, helping our clients to develop strong green strategies um, and, um, and, and, and getting ready for, for, for future environmental issues. That was a business that didn't exist um, 20 years ago. Um, it is now um, around about 25% of our business. Um, and that's the same if you look at things like the work that we are doing in hydrogen up in the northwest of England, designing a scheme called HiNet, um, working on renewable energy. That's been a huge transition for us um, but before we even get to, to, to emerging areas such as building retrofit. So there's a top line growth for us. We've also got a program called Future Ready, which is all about we will see the future more clearly and then we will challenge and inspire every one of our 50,000 people to, to, to use their cleverness to, to advise and design to that future as well as today. And just integrating that into all that we do, that has helped us as a business win £75 million pounds of work in our UK business last year. So for us, as an example, green is a massive growth and top line opportunity for us. And that's probably the, the main sort of takeaway I would encourage all of us to take on this as businesses on this, um, on, on this call. Second thing to talk about future, we have barely just scratched this. Um, if we are going to be effectively a zero carbon economy, in the next 30 years, there is massive business action and business opportunity. And if you just look at some of the key dates that Committee on Climate Change, the UK's um, government's advisor on climate sets out. In 2025, all new buildings have to be built to be zero carbon. So that's a massive opportunity or, or a threat, depending on how you look at that, for, for design teams, um, if, for, for, for gas engineers and building trades. By 2025, we also have to be planting across the UK 30,000 hectares of, of, of new woodland every year. That's a massive opportunity for our farming and our nursery industries. There is just quite simply today not enough capacity for homegrown trees in the UK to fulfil that need. So there's a great growth opportunity to scale up for that. By 2028, we need to be fitting 600,000 heat pumps every year in the UK. 
and every home has to have a minimum energy performance certificate of C if you're going to rent or sell that. So that's a great business opportunity for, for building retrofit. 2030, petrol and diesel sales for, for, for new cars and vans will be phased out. If you're a garage, that's a great opportunity to get ready for that future. Before you then get to those bigger areas um, around things like by 2040, construction has to be fully decarbonized. And you know what? Just like you on this call are, are, are interested in green issues, so are customers. We know from WSP that our customers really care about this. And so therefore we are responding to their need and that is our growth. And then lastly, action. We are all busy people in business. It's great that, that, that together we're spending a couple of hours talking about this, but we will only really drive Kingston's economy um, and, 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 and grow back better and, and, and make the most of this as, 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 as business leaders if from this we take action. So I'd just like to conclude by saying Forbes and the Chamber of Commerce, that's great to be running this session. Let's together really make sure that we're taking some action out of this um, and, um, and, and we're using this as a, as, as, as a catalyst to really set Kingston businesses apart and, um, and, and continue to grow. Thank you. David, thank you very, very much. I think, um, as you correctly said, this is the catalyst. This is the starting point. There is a long race to, to run with this, but I'm really encouraged by how everybody's getting involved and to start the conversation to understand what it means and to see the facts and the figures and see how we can go forward with this. So I hope as, a, as an introduction, and I've gone a wee bit longer, it's given you a really kind of good full perspective on sort of the green agenda and what green transition actually means. What we're about to go into shortly now is the respective breakout groups. Um, Amanda, who is uh, the technical whiz here, this will pop up in a minute on your screens so you can choose which group you want to go into. Um, the one thing which, I'm always kind of quite good at introducing everybody else, but um, without saying too much, I'm actually Forbes Lowe. I'm the chief exec of the Kingston Chamber of Commerce. I realized I didn't even introduce myself. So I'm not going on an egotistical trip here. I actually have a purpose in this conversation. So I should have said that at the beginning. So my apologies if you're wondering who the hell's this person going on and on and on. Um, anyways, thank you for our speakers here. We are now going to go into the respective groups. We have an hour and then um, you will all come back to the lobby. There'll be about a 10 minute break and then we'll go into the plenary sessions. Thank you and we'll see you a little bit later together. Forbes, do you want to remind people of the three rooms before I open them? Yes, okay, thank you. So we've got the three rooms are built environment, construction, energy and transport. We have business, professional services, manufacturing technology, and then hospitality which incorporates retail, arts, culture, and leisure. 